Good afternoon. What you see before you here is somebody who is 100% pure Chinese. A thousand generations of Chinese genes, Han Chinese bloodlines, unbroken. Well, actually, I'm not sure about any of that. My own family history goes back maybe three generations, after which it sort of fades into the mist of history. Then the idea of the Han Chinese, the dominant ethnic group in China, is a little bit of a social construction, an invention of just a few centuries ago. And then there's this kind of legend in my family that my mother's mother was descended from Genghis Khan. And so I must be too. So the idea that I am 100% pure anything is folly. Here's what I am. I'm the son of immigrants who were born in China. I myself was born and raised in the outer orbit of New York City during the turbulent 1970s. So from the get-go, I'm a impure, mixed up, mashed up, multicultural hybrid. And one of the things when I think about my own lineage, my own cultural DNA, yes, there's a big chunk there of Confucian values and thinking, a Confucian regard for the other and relational patterns of behavior. But there's also a good big chunk of Captain Kirk. There's a big chunk of the values and the ethics of Starfleet. There's a big chunk of the New York style of urban immigrant patriotism. And in Seattle, where I've been now since 2000, there's a good chunk in my ethics of a, an Asian Scandinavian pioneer spirit that pervades Seattle. There's a chunk, yes, of the poetry of the Chinese language and the concision and the beauty of the ways that Chinese expresses ideas. But then the same is true of the words that have seeped into my soul from Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and Jane Addams. And so I ask you, in thinking about how pure you are, what is your lineage? Where do you come from? We live in a time right now, and this is largely because of technology and the way that technology makes it simultaneously possible for us to mix more than ever and also sort more than ever. We live in a time in our culture and politics that is obsessed increasingly with purity. In France, politicians and intellectuals alike conjure up images of an Islamic takeover of that nation. Here in the United States, white Americans conjure up fears of a Mexican takeover. Recruiters for ISIS conjure up fears of the corrupting influence of modernism and modernity itself. In China, leaders and influentials conjure up fears of the ways in which Western values and universal ideas like human rights are a contagion that needs to be stopped. Heck, even Star Wars fans are conjuring up fears of a movie that has a black and a female protagonist. We live in this age where all of these folks are gaining voice and power, and they can all be described in a similar way. They are identity fundamentalists. They dream of purity, of blood, of belief, and behavior. Well, I hate purity. I hate it. I detest the very pretense of it, and I deny the possibility of it. And what I want to speak about this afternoon is making the civic case for impurity for relentless, ceaseless hybridizing. And I want to speak a moment about what I mean, why it matters, and how we together can go about bringing together the hybrid vision that we've been talking about all day. Let me start with what. Here's what I mean simply in defining hybridity. The simple mixing of unlike elements. It sounds very simple, and yet it requires a bit of precision. Because one of the things that's become very common in civic life over the last generation or 30, 40 years, in a good way, is that we've gotten into the habit in all of our institutions, in companies, in conferences, on college campuses, we've gotten into the habit of talking about diversity, celebrating diversity. Now, to be very clear, this is progress. This is way better than what had preceded it, which was neither seeing nor knowing nor acknowledging the presence or the value of diversity. But I think it's really important to distinguish between diversity, which is simply the presence of unlike elements, and hybridity, which is the actual mixing of those elements. 
What we should be celebrating is not diversity. What we, what we should be celebrating is what we do with diversity. And what we do with diversity is we make hybrids over and over and over again. That is the point of life at every fractal scale of life. That's what I mean by hybridity. Well, why does this matter? Why does it matter to even make that distinction between diversity and hybridity? Well, it matters for several reasons, particularly for those of us who are Americans, those of us who've been born and raised or happen to arrive in the United States here in the 21st century. It matters in the first place because when we think about what hybridity is and how it plays out, it is the central catalytic element in any notion of innovation. Think about the history of innovation just in the United States, from the cotton gin to the iPhone, from jazz to football. Every American innovation there ever was, from the common law to the creative commons, is the product of hybridization, is the product of taking an element that existed, adapting it, revising it, mutating it, melding it with other elements, creating things that did not exist before. That is at the very heart of the idea of innovation, which is at the very heart of the idea of America. But the idea of America itself, more broadly, is about hybridity. And to take a very simple case, just imagine the United States. American, American, uh, imagine American life without African American life. Do a momentary thought experiment. I submit to you it is impossible to conceive of America without African America. I submit to you it is impossible to pull out that one strand. And that's not just in our culture. That's not just in jazz or in hip hop today. That is in the very fabric of the Constitution. You pull out that thread and the fabric of all of the glory and the hypocrisy of our constitutional scheme falls to the floor. Hybridity is baked into the very idea of what this country is. Indeed, this country is planet Earth's most relentless generator of new hybrids. And that is not just an interesting fact. It actually gives us a bit of a sense of national purpose. Because in this day and age right now, there is a bit of competitive advantage to be found in this embrace of hybridity. So if you think about the rise of China right now and the way in which sometime in current course and speed in the next decade or two decades, China's GDP may surpass that of the United States. That day may come when we can no longer, at least economically, say we're number one here in the United States. To which I say, big deal. Big deal. Because the United States, if we don't blow it, will have retained a deep and enduring competitive advantage. An advantage which I put simply this way. America makes Chinese Americans. China does not make American Chinese. China does not want to, does not know how to, does not have in their operating system, culturally or ethically, the idea of taking unlike elements from all around the planet, creating a space where they are at least theoretically welcome, and then creating a space where at least theoretically they have the opportunity to develop themselves to their full capacity. We have that in theory. We have that on paper. And the competitive advantage the United States retains in the world is delivered upon to the extent that we convert that theory and that possibility through commitment into action. That's why it matters. So this brings me to the third and the final piece that I want to speak about, which is the how. How do we get there? And I don't mean just Americans. How do we as humans foster this kind of culture and civic embrace of hybridity? Well, I think in the first place, as a matter of values, we have to be willing to name it. We have to take words and memes and tropes that are in our political and civic life, like liberal, conservative, white, black, Asian, Latino, and unpack, reverse engineer every one of those umbrella labels and concepts, and look inside and see and embrace and reveal to everyone else around us the hybridity and the complexity that's contained with any one of those notions to not treat these as monochromatic and not treat these as fixed. That's a matter of naming, but it's also a matter of mindset. But then it requires a set of systems, of institutions, that can actually foster the collisions and the connections of hybridity. 
This is the point of public schooling. This is the point of national service, of which I'm a big believer. This is the point of cities. This is the point of convenings like PopTech, not just to have an interesting two of every kind, bird's eye view of how interesting, like, interestingly diverse this room is, but to have a commitment of values and systems for us to change one another by encountering one another. For me plus you to equal something that is neither me plus you. And then it means embracing in our skills of citizenship, our everyday skills, how to negotiate, how to communicate, how to advocate, how to organize, how to navigate change, how to navigate complexity. All of these skills that every one of us in our lives as members of the civic body, pro-social contributors to a community, which is what I mean by citizen. I'm not talking about documentation status under the immigration laws. I'm talking about being a non-sociopath <laughs> in community. <laughs> when we are a citizen in that sense, and living our everyday lives, all we have to do is add a dose of intentionality and think about how we organize, communicate, advocate, navigate with an eye to hybridity, with an eye to thinking about who are people unlike me? What are elements unlike me that I might be able to intersect with? This requires choice. It requires intention. At Citizen University, the nonprofit that I run, we do this work by trying to collect voraciously, connect relentlessly, and curate curiously. We've created this, I suppose, social technology of sorts, something called the Civic Collaboratory, a web of civic innovators drawn from across the country, from all different geographies, all different points along the political spectrum, and all different sub-silos of what you might broadly think of as civic work. People from the veterans world, from the immigrants world, from civic education, from Hollywood, from civic tech, from the faith community, from all different domains. And what we do, again, is not just build a little Noah's Ark of interesting people and let them sail side by side. What we do is we create formats and opportunities every time we convene for people to change one another. And we do that not by trying in some artificial way to contrive a common purpose and say, come on, you from the Tea Party and you from Occupy. Come on, you who is a famous person and you who is an unknown citizen activist. Let's all pretend we have the same purpose. That doesn't work. What does work is to reveal the opportunity that is implicit in hybridity and to say, if we create moments for you to work together, to play together, to build bonds of trust and affection, you will create hybrids. There will be interesting collaborations that will emerge between you on the left and you on the right. And out of that will come cross-partisan projects and initiatives and ideas on reforming the criminal justice system, or rolling back crony capitalism, or changing the way we think about integration and acculturation in the United States. In all of these realms, what we're trying to do simply is to recognize a mutuality of interest that can feed that drive to hybridity. Well, when I think about one of the earliest influences on me in my thinking and worldview about hybridity, I think about Walt Whitman, who said famously in Song of Myself, of every hue and caste am I, of every rank and religion, I resist anything better than my own diversity. That was Whitman. That was one man. And he could not resist that diversity, that inner fact that he contained multitudes. Indeed, not only did he not resist it, he chose actively to activate it in his worldview, in his work, in his poetry, in the song that he sung. And our job as citizens in this most capacious sense is to create a song of ourselves, a song of us and a story of us that is similarly about activating that diversity in the service of hybridity in art, in science, in technology, in politics, in everyday life, in big projects that are visible and tiny little choices that are not seen. The simple slogan on the backs of our coins here in the United States, e pluribus unum, from many, one. Okay, that's a pretty good slogan, but only only if you accept the idea that the unum is not some fixed monochrome thing. The unum is neither 
a bowl of whiteness into which non-whites are meant to hop in and melt. The unum is not simply some completely deracinated notion of what it means to be or to be American. The unum in the end is hybrid. The unum in the end is the embrace of the hybrid. And that's what it means not only to be American but to be human. I began by talking about that 1,000 generations of Chinese blood and bloodline that I purported to be the latest carrier of. And even if that were true, I've broken it. I have a daughter who is Chinese American, yes, but more accurately, Chinese, Scotch, Irish, Lithuanian, Jewish American. <laughs> she has her father's features, her mother's freckles, she has a true hybrid beauty and a beautiful hybrid sense of the possibility of our times, of our moment, our society. And guess what? So do you. Thank you very much. Thank you.